Hi, everybody. How's it going? It looks like people are still filtering in over here. That's good. Well, thanks for showing up. Wow, this room is packed. Jesus. Wasn't there anything else interesting going on today? <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, network virtualization and really making a case uh, for how network virtualization works in the cloud. Um, I'm the chief strategy officer at a company called Midacora. We happen to be a network virtualization vendor, so I might have some opinions along the way. I'm going to try to keep this fairly uh, non-vendor uh, related and just talk about you know this particular approach. Uh, and uh, I might end a little bit early and just go to questions uh, from people. It looks like it's a fairly um, broad audience over here uh, with uh, some people that are very technical and some people that are very business, so uh, it, it becomes a little bit tough to put together a presentation that fits everybody, so we'll leave some space for questions afterwards. Um, but thanks for joining. Really appreciate everybody's time today. Um, you know, really, everyone in this room is going through this whole process of building a cloud, and uh, these are things that you guys understand fairly, fairly in detail. You know, there are a few different building blocks in terms of building a cloud. Um, and the things that, uh, when you're looking at products having to do with, with building cloud, especially scaling, you look for things that end up having properties of scaling that are linear. And when I say linear scaling, you know, it's the idea of being able to add more like host in order to have more capacity rather than being able to get bigger and bigger devices and scaling up. Uh, this is a concept that seems to be fairly standard in the cloud, especially because usage patterns in general are, uh, are elastic. <laughs> and sometimes you end up having a lot of bandwidth. I mean, sometimes you have a lot of traffic on your cloud, sometimes you don't, sometimes you, you understand how you're going to end up using your particular property. Uh, sometimes you understand what your tenants are trying to do. Sometimes you don't understand what your tenants are trying to do. And because of that, you end up with this situation where it's very hard to end up doing real capacity planning in the cloud. Um, and w back to the idea of elements. You know, in, in terms of elements of the cloud, there are really four big pieces that end up making up what people think are their clouds. You know, you have the open stacks. Uh, and this is, you know, cloud management fabric. I don't really need to talk to you guys what that means. <laughs> Maybe in a different audience it might make sense. Uh, you have the, the hypervisor part, which is really the compute part. Uh, these are really, I'd say, the two of the most popular hypervisors in the cloud at the moment. Uh, I'd say in this room, this is probably the, the most applicable. I think there are a couple of others, which I failed to mention, but I don't think that they really, <laughs> they really make much of a dent in this audience. Uh, you know, there's ways to handle compute, like it says, and, and we talked about scaling a bit before. When you end up scaling out compute, you end up scaling it in a very linear sort of approach by adding new boxes in order to be able to handle that sort of scaling. Um, you know, storage up till recently has been kind of a very interesting phenomenon where there really weren't very good options in terms of how to scale out storage. You ended up having to use big iron boxes that were EMC boxes or very large SANs, and, and they didn't have a very good scale-out story. Projects like Ceph, projects uh, like OpenStack Swift, uh, Solid Fire is out here in the audience, so they might be here somewhere. Um, they also have a product that ends up having, uh, handling scale-out storage, and Gluster does. So now there, there's a whole group of people that are talking about storage and trying to handle that in the scale-out way, and that's a very important thing. So. We have an ability to, to scale out compute. We have ability to scale out storage. We have this cloud management system that ends up scaling out with us as well. And really, the problem that we have today is very much a networking problem. You end up with, when you end up building a network for, uh, for the cloud, it's very hard, number one, a capacity plan to figure out exactly what your traffic requirements are going to be in the cloud. Um, it, it, it also ends up, and, and not just capacity plan, but the idea of traffic engineering and the idea of like where your network hotspots are, are very difficult as well, because you end up with um, 
if you have a VM on one rack and a VM in another rack all the way on the other side of the data center and you end up having to go through interim boxes to handle networking, you end up creating these uh, hotspots in areas that doesn't make a whole lot of sense and it doesn't scale out. And you end up having these interim devices in the way that don't scale out properly. Um, and the idea is to be able to scale out rather than scale up. You know, uh, getting bigger and bigger devices is not a cost-effective sort of approach for building cloud. If you're a service provider in the audience, you know, you have a business requirement where you need to build a cloud that is competitive in price and that can uh, compete in terms of functionality as well. And when you end up having to rely on physical gear in order to be able to make that happen, you can end up scaling out uh, in a way that uh, ends up having a linear pricing model either. So there's business reasons why you end up wanting to scale up, I mean scale out rather than scale up. Um, in terms of networking as well, let's say that there's a NAT device in your cloud and you end up using this device to handle all NAT within your cloud. Well, having to replace this device ends up introducing ideas of, or possibilities of service, service interruptions. And you end up with all of these different areas within your network that also end up being almost these logical single points of failure within your system. And having to scale these up by replacing these devices uh, dramatically increases your, uh, your chances of service interruptions. And that's a, that's a pretty big problem, honestly. It's, uh, that's something that's not very easy to, uh, to handle. Uh, the other thing is this physical devices as a whole, when you end up looking at physical devices like these switches and these routers and, and other pieces within uh, your network, these load balancers are out there, really aren't designed to be manipulated and configured at that high churn and microgranularity that the cloud environment has. You end up having lots of customers that are doing very micro type uh, config changes on these boxes. And these particular devices aren't built to handle that kind of speed, that churn, that granularity. And really, you run into a lot of limitations on the physical layer uh, having to do with the network uh, as you start building this out. Um, this is a fairly apparent one that a lot of people in the cloud have been talking about for a long time, but you have the limitations of VLANs. And if you're doing a moderately sized cloud, let's say it's you know, something that is a public facing cloud, it's very easy to get to a, a tenant count or a project count of over 4,096. And VLANs have an upper limit limitation of 4,096 VLANs uh, per network. And so uh, even if you're not doing, if you're doing an internal cloud for, let's say, a large company or, or a company as a whole, it's very easy to get to the idea of where you have more than 4,000 projects on that cloud as well. So, uh, you know, the limitations of VLANs are there. If you end up looking at other networking type technologies other than VLANs, you end up not only with that physical device configuration issue, but there are other issues that pop their head out that make it very difficult and insane, even cumbersome to be able to scale out your cloud having to do with network isolation. Um, I've mentioned this a little bit, but if you have a load balancer in your cloud that's, servering, that's serv servicing your users, you end up steering traffic to a device in the middle of your cloud somewhere, and that device is pointed at other uh, VMs or hosts in your cloud, or maybe outside of your cloud, and you're routing traffic one place to spit it out another place, so you end up having these single points where you're routing traffic through in order to make that happen. And that's, you know, the terminology for that is a traffic trombone that you're creating. And this is something that also is not scalable. Anytime you introduce these points in between that traffic has to go through, um, it, it doesn't scale at the level of the cloud, uh, of the cloud. and when, we're, when I'm talking about cloud, I'm talking about you know, the ability to get into the thousands of hosts. Your limitation really becomes networking as you start, uh, start doing this and, and getting it to this point. So just the physical network as a whole 
is a big problem. And these are the main points that I would say present in terms of like, you know, physical networking and, and uh, you know, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is the human cost. You know, when you look at uh, the OpEx expense in terms of managing a cloud and managing a network, you know, we were talking to one provider uh, a few months back that had something like 500 network engineers that were doing minute changes having to do with firewall rule changes, router changes, like, you know, making decisions on, on just tiny little network things. And that is, I mean, for a normal organization, that's not scalable, but I, I don't even understand how it's scalable for a large telco. <laughs> you know, and when you start making these, uh, these choices and you start throwing people at the problem, I don't think it's an actual, it doesn't make sense. And the model in the cloud is how do you end up making everything uh, lower your OpEx costs, lower your CapEx costs, get everything down to the point where you have as little people involved in it, and can, if you end up having to do any sort of configuration or management, do it with the smallest amount of people as possible. So the human costs really don't scale that well within, uh, within networking. And networking seems to be really that last frontier. It's like that area that nobody's really messing with or, well, not very many people. Uh, th this company is, <laughs> but, but not, not very many other people are uh, are doing things in this space, and they they seem to be looking at this as a physical problem. Which it's it's more than that. You know, you end up needing to be able to handle networking in the physical space, of course. But um, we think that there's an actual better approach to this, and there's a few companies that are taking a different model to this. Rather than manipulating physical devices in the, in the network space and connecting them to projects like Quantum where you end up having some of these pieces being automated and the ability to handle L2 constructs and other things of that sort. Um, the idea, I think, that is a bigger idea, and it's an idea that our company as well as some other companies out there have is, um, distribute the intelligence out of the network all the way to the edges. Treat basically, I mean, I'll, I'll get back to this page in a second, but the idea is use encapsulation in order to create a virtual network, right? So you end up using encapsulation and handling the intelligence all the way to the edge. So um, these devices that you have at the edge, these machines that you have at the edge, which are x86 boxes, end up receiving these encapsulated packets and being able to decapsulate them, and they end up handling um, really the network transformations on these packets and the calculations having to do with what that virtual topology is. And from the point of view of the user, it looks like they end up going through a logical topology, if you look at that top piece over there, from the point of view of the user, they end up going through routers and switches and getting to the end house and to the VM. But from the point of view of the physical network, um, all we're doing is using the physical network as a dumb pipe, as a medium to send from one to the other. We handle the network intelligence at the edges, um, and we really trick the, the user into into making it look like they have these virtual constructs. We don't require physical devices in order to be able to handle this. Now, this is an approach that is a much, much more scalable approach. Because you don't end up with these devices in between, it ends up being something that's definitely uh, much more scalable. We end up treating the physical network like they're really dumb pipes. So we're removing all that intelligence, which we've traditionally relied on, within the middle of the network, that physical part of the network, and saying, hey, you know what? We don't want the physical part of the network to handle it. We're gonna handle it as close to the edge as possible and handle it in an x86 gear and handle it in a way that's very scalable. So we end up handling not, not just us, but other solutions, and when I say we, so I'm saying this group of people that are solving this problem end up doing these network transformations, making it look like this is happening, requiring much less of the physical network, since 
Since our products have an idea of the network topology, we can also do a lot more interesting things. Like if there is traffic coming from you know, one side of the network and it's destined for a VM, let's say traffic's coming in, uh, in from the internet, it's destined for VM1, but there's a traffic rule on VM1 saying do not accept that traffic. Rather than putting that on the physical network at all, we drop it right at the edge of the network. And you, know, you can do more interesting things, which is we have an idea of the network topology, right? And this concept and this idea of distributing intelligence out to the edges, creating an overlay, uh, it ends up requiring less of the physical network, and you don't run into the physical limitations that a network normally provides. I feel bad for that dog. <laughs> but you don't end up with these limitations. You, know, you don't end up with the limitations of having to deal with the network to deal with the high churn uh, of that. You don't have to do with it, deal with the, the granularity because all the intelligence is pushed out to the edges and then we're not re requiring physical devices in between in order to be able to handle um, you know, the load balancing or the NAT or any of these other sorts of concepts. Uh, you don't end up with these traffic trombones. You don't end up with VLAN limitations that are out there, right? And this solves all of those problems, but really the point of the talk was how to scale networking in the cloud. And the big problem that distributed, overlay-based network virtualization solves is it ends up letting the cloud operator, as you guys, be able to treat networking much like you treat compute and much like you treat storage right now. It grows at a very linear scale. So you only have to pay as much as you use. You add more host as you need more capacity. Uh, it scales out very linearly. If you don't need that much capacity, you can reduce the amount of host. Um, it's a model that's very similar to what projects like Ceph and Cluster and SolidFire are doing with storage, you know, and it's a very, it, that model is, is akin to how the network ends up, that network model of scaling, I mean, that cloud model of scaling works. So you almost have to take this approach in order to truly build a scalable cloud without these limitations. Now, of course, there are people in the room that have built these clouds before and have not used these technologies. But one thing that we're finding as providers that make this type of technology is as people are starting to build their second generation clouds, they're starting to realize that this type of intelligence at the edge makes a lot of sense. And they're looking at products like ours and you know, furthering uh, their investigation and their analysis of these products and seeing if this technology fits them. And they're starting to realize that. If you look about a year ago or so, nobody had really any knowledge about network virtualization. And fast forward today, I think I was looking through the Sketch uh, panel, there was something like eight different talks having to do with network virtualization with different vendors. And that's amazing. I mean, that industry came out of nowhere and everyone is really now starting to say, okay, you know what? This isn't something that just solves a problem of scale. It's a more intelligent way of building your cloud as a whole and can end up being more cost effective. So, and I think this room is evidence that there is interest, <laughs> at least in trying to figure out like what the hell this thing is. So it really is a different way of thinking about networking as a whole. Rather than thinking about these interim devices, you end up thinking about how do you end up turning your whole cloud into one big network device? It's a really, it's a very difficult distributed systems problem to solve. And you know there are a few companies working on this. And I'm sure some of these guys in our room, I'm with the company called Midacora that, <laughs> that solves this problem, as you can see by that really big logo on the screen. Um, there's another company that recently got bought by uh, another large company <laughs> that's probably in this room as well, that uh, has a product in this space as well. And, um, Big Switch, who's also another great company, is looking to solve this problem. And um, you know, I'm sure that there are other vendors that are coming this way. I, you know, there's rumors every day of new companies like Cisco and Plumgrid, and there's a spin-in called CME. I don't know if I'm uh, pronouncing that right, <laughs> but 
you know, there's a lot of people in this space that are really looking to solve this problem. And I, I believe this is a, a problem that is very, very well suited for infrastructure as a service networking. There might be other applications for that, but this particular model, especially because scale out is so important and the insight into the traffic is a lot less and you really need the flexibility in order to do this fits very well within cloud networking. So that being said, these are the reasons why I think that uh, distributed overlay based network virtualization makes a lot of sense in the cloud. These are really kind of the big points around it. There's a lot of products that solve this problem and like I said, if you guys have any questions or wanna talk, that's great. I know that there are other vendors in the room as well so if someone comes up and asks a question and it's not about something that I can answer, feel free to jump up and uh, start talking about what you guys have to offer as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> There's a mic right there. I was thinking uh, it's kind of hard to get away from the challenge of getting the physical topology right. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the physical topology right, it turns out that um, clever ways of rerouting traffic and all that are so, sort of limited. They can't do very much for you. But is there some um, more flexible design of the physical topology and how you arrange your switches and so forth, which makes this virtualization easier, more productive. I don't, yeah. I, hear, I hear a lot about the value of network virtualization, but very little of it is uh, sort of, you know, tied to what must one do at the substrate yeah. in order to make this a viable solution. I think that's a really good point, and I think that you know, one really good thing about being part of a community like this is people love to share. Um, and there are people that are building these clouds and trying to figure out, you know, the best way to approach these things. And one of the good things is, is, is they're finding out about this. People are, are publishing their reference architectures and talking about what they're doing. I expect to see a lot more of this um, because really there's value in sharing all that information. From a product perspective, at least the products that you know, I mentioned that do distributed overlays, you know, the requirement that I've seen, at least in our product and another one of these products uh, that are there, uh, is IP connectivity. So it's very important to build a robust, uh, well thought out IP fabric uh, in order to be able to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that, I mean, these things still need, there needs to be a lot of thought into it. And there needs to be, you need to have strong engineering talent to make sure that you've designed this thing properly. Um, but this is a very well-known problem. The internet is a very large IP network, right? So it's something that I think that the capability and the skill set is out there in order to be able to handle fairly well. Um, and, you know, the, the idea mostly of pushing these things out to the edges really for another thing, and this is not completely in that question, but it raises another point. Because you only um, ask for IP connectivity between hosts, and that's all you require, the physical network, well, that's the requirement of, let's say, the net engineering team, right? Everything above that space in that virtual cloud area, virtual network area, is something that's run more by your ops and your cloud admin team. So as projects like these also come out, there's gonna be more of a demarcation line between who's responsible for it and you know how you connect in and how you don't, right? And it took a little while for people to figure that out with server virtualization. And is it the same guys that end up being managing the physical servers that are gonna be able to manage the virtual servers? But over time, people figured that out and I think it's gonna be a bit of a culture shift because this really blurs the lines quite a bit. But Back to your point, from uh, the point of view of the physical network, it's very important to build something that's right, and I think that knowledge is that knowledge is definitely out there. So I, I would say that it, it, it that's an easier problem to solve, I think, than being able to build 
a network that scales out, that has more, that's engineered with the proper traffic patterns and all of this other details that you need to have in order to build a cloud network. So, any other questions? So, uh, so if you overlay the network, so the user have to manage the two networks, right? The non underlay network and then overlay network. So, uh, and then there are so many problems with the underlay network in the physical network. Then sometimes it's already overlaid or sometimes encapsulated like a 90 sec or VPN. Then you are proposing an overlay of the overlay network. So how do you scale managing two network uh, in that case? Well, um, this is why I think infrastructure as a service is a really good fit for this particular thing. You automatically already have users managing their own virtual machines, right? And they're setting up their own firewall rules. And uh, a solution like this allows them to do a little bit more. They can end up setting up virtual routers and connecting these routers together and so, uh, setting up switches and connecting these switches to particular hosts and uh, particular VMs and that sort. So it gives the end user a little bit more flexibility. The benefit of the integration of these products into projects like OpenStack really allow that cloud user in order to have that flexibility. So if you look at that top pane over there, that's managed completely by the end user. You look at that bottom pane over there, and that's managed by the cloud operator. Now there's probably going to be cloud admins and support staff and other people that are involved in your cloud that want insight into that virtual network and want to be able to manually configure that as well. But really, we think that you know our, our feeling is that if you do your good job and you tie these things together, and you present these in a particular way to the end user, a lot, a lot of this should be very transparent to the cloud operator, and they should only have to be really responsible for maintaining that physical network, right? So um, I, I don't think it actually doubles their uh, work. It actually makes their work a little bit easier, uh, particularly in the idea that if you were to have the other approach to this, let's say you had networking devices that were these physical devices, you end up having to build a lot of integration scripts and uh, have a whole, uh, a lot of kludgy sort of ways of managing that physical network uh, to be able to tie into something like an OpenStack in order to be able to handle all of that stuff programmatically. It's a really big challenge. Um, and when you end up abstracting it all away and looking at a solution like this or solutions like these, um, it ends up being much less of a challenge uh, from an operations point of view. Um, and I think that the big key about that is the tight integration with projects like OpenStack. If that integration wasn't there, then yeah, it would be a pain in the butt. <laughs> also, there is, uh, you know, all of these projects also have APIs on their own. So even if there wasn't that particular fabric and you had your own management fabric that you were using in order to be able to do, uh, uh, to be able to do you know, VM creation or something like that. You can tie all of these things together through these projects, individual APIs, to be able to do similar things as well. So could you talk a little bit more about the tight integration with OpenStack? That it seems like Quantum has the uh, soft software-defined networking as one option. Yeah. But I didn't see how your option would be better than another one with OpenStack. I, I don't think it's a, um, hmm, that's a very good question. The, the question, I think, if let me repeat it right, is uh, you see other people plugging into things like Quantum. You're wondering how this is any different than them using something like Quantum, right? Um, well, Quantum only provides a certain amount at this moment. Right. Um, at least as of Essex, it only had uh, layer two, uh, up to layer two functionality. Uh, as of the last version, more services are being put into Quantum. There are still services that are handled by Nova Network Manager that require persistence in order to be able to handle, uh, a persistence object model in order to be able to handle uh, services like security groups. Um, and so there are, you know, if you look at as of at least Essex, that's L2, and then at Essex, everything else that was in Nova 
like floating IPs, security groups, uh, you know, all of the associated things having to do with VM creation, like ha having to tie these concept of routers together and tying bridges together and tying those to machines that happened at, at uh, the initial API call. These are all things that happen really kind of outside of quantum a bit. Now, I think eventually all of that stuff is gonna go over, but integration, proper integration, we believe, requires integration not only with quantum, but also Nova at this moment. As things move over to a different model and as quantum becomes more fully flushed out, then it might make more sense. But um, you know, we believe that you end up having to integrate at two different points right now. Uh, and I think a lot of these projects that are out there that have quantum integration only have a certain level of functionality because they only have quantum integration, right? So uh, the network is bigger than quantum in OpenStack. Is that helpful? Any other questions? Sure, do you mind if you go up to the mic? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, not in our model. I think Big Switch actually probably can speak a little bit more about that. If they're in the room over here, they, they could probably talk about it. The question is, is there any intersection with open flow? And in our model, there isn't. Um, I think in the Sierra's model, I believe, they use open flow in order to control the open V switch that are on the host of these machines. We don't actually do that. Uh, and the big switches model I can't speak of because they're not public yet. So, oh, feel free to, feel free to add if you want to. Thank you, thank you, excellent. <laughs> sure. I'd say it's very easy to give us a call. <laughs> but I would say for the vendors in here as well, I mean, everyone's fielding calls, everyone's talking about this. Um, there are a few sites out there that are really excellent. There's one site um, uh, written by a blogger named Ivan, whose last name I can't pronounce, uh, called iOS Hints. Uh, that's a good site to go to. There's another site called Network Static. Uh, there's another, and that's, I believe, done by the, uh, Martin Casado at Nasira. Uh, there's another one called Network Heresy. Uh, there's another one uh, that a blogger at Dell uh, is at called, um, well, it's his name, Brad Headland. Uh, so there are a few different sites out there that really kind of cover this space, and not just cover this space, but cover mostly like intelligent data center networking thoughts. And they talk about a lot of stuff. They talk about overlays, they talk about class fabrics, they talk about uh, open flow, they talk about, you know, uh, VRFs and the scalability model. They talk about Juniper Solutions and Cisco. So I think a broad education actually is very helpful just to kind of understand this as well. And and you know, like I said earlier, the 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 type of people that's involved in this, you know, it's always been these network guys that have had a lot of depth on this, and that's starting to move on up, kind of to more of an application server admin sort of group of people. So. I think there's more people that are gonna have to get more depth that haven't been used to it in networking, and these are all really great places to start from. And also, I think all of our vendors, all these vendors that are out here, have blogs of their own. Uh, Big Switch is very involved in the ONF, and they've done a great job in uh, network, I mean, education around uh, not just open flow, but software-defined networking as a whole. So I'd say all of those places would be some of the first places I, w I would kind of go to and look at. 
And then after you have a little bit of an idea on what you're trying to do and whether these fit, talking to vendors uh, is helpful as well. Um, and you know, you'll, have, you'll be armed with more information so you can call people out. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for your time, guys. I really appreciate it.